everyone. Well, welcome. I hope you've got your Bible with you because we're going to be looking uh, at 2 Corinthians chapter 4 today. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. So if you open up your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, I'm going to read this passage of Scripture to us and then we are going to dive in to our message today. The title of the message today is this, Inside Job. Inside job. That's the title of the message. So if you're taking notes, I want you to put that at the top of the screen, inside at the top of the screen, um, at the top of your notes, at the top of your page, um, whatever it is, just whatever you do. If you've got a paper Bible, don't try and scroll using it. It doesn't work like that. You have to still turn the pages. So put it at the top of the page, inside job, and that's where we're going with today because we live in a world that's focused on the exterior. We live in a world right now that's focused on everything that we can see, everything we can feel, everything that we can touch, everything you can smell, everything you can taste. We, we, we focus on those things in our world that are exterior, that are on the outside. And yet the prevailing theme in Scripture is that what happens on the inside is the thing that is the most important. We, God works in us from the inside out. How many of you, when you came to faith in Jesus, you wonder, you realized that there was a change that happened in, the internally before changes started to happen externally? There was a change of heart before there was a change of behavior. There was a change of mind before there was a change in your habits. Those things take a while to happen on the outside and God's always working on the inside of us. And even today, speaking to you right Right now, it's a little bit of a metaphor for that, I guess. You know, we're here in the bit of a massive facility on a massive property in a massive part of Victoria, and we're coming to you from one single laptop this morning. And so there's this sense to which it doesn't really matter what's going on on the outside if the inside isn't pure. And so what God is doing in us right now is transforming and changing the inside of us that then it works itself out onto the outside. Um, for those of you who are Star Wars fans, I'm just going to give you an absolute gift this morning. You might remember in uh, in A New Hope, there's the scene where they come and, and um, Luke Skywalker and Obi-Wan are trying to get to get to a different place and they need a... Um, they need someone to take them and Han Solo comes onto the scene and they get a, they get introduced to the Millennium Falcon and Luke says something like, what a piece of junk. And Obi-Wan says, she's got it where it counts, kid. It's this idea that what happens on the inside of us is more important than what happens on the outside. All right, here we go. Let's have a look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We're going to be starting at verse 7 and working our way down to verse 12. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We're hard-pressed on every side, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but we're not in despair. We're persecuted, but we're not abandoned. We're struck down, but we're not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus might also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. Amen and amen. So that's 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7 to verse 12. What I'd love you to do right at this point is we have had a bit of an interruption with our stream this morning. It's kind of come on and off a couple of times. The team have worked really, really hard to get it happening here. So I'd love it if you could just stop right now and share this stream. If you're on Facebook, I'd love it if you shared it. Or if, you're, if you're watching on YouTube, I'd love it if you would just maybe just even grab the link and send it to somebody or share it if you can. Like that like it and put a comment in there. It actually really helps the algorithm and pushes it up. So there may be some people this morning who their stream dropped out for whatever reason. And we can all do something right now by helping people get back online and get into this service and into this message right now as we continue on in this uh, in this series of Hope Lives Here. 
I love this passage, and I think we all resonate with this idea of being jars of clay. The idea here that, that, um, that we carry around in us this glory, but we're a jar of clay. We're essentially something fragile, something brittle, something that's easily broken. Uh, our church building facility here in Mount Evelyn is literally a jar of clay. It's made out of mud bricks, and we know how that feels and how those kinds of things work over a long period of time in terms of how brittle they are are and how time and erosion happens to us all and we so we're but personally we're literally made jars of clay in a sense as well because of Genesis where Genesis said that God picked up a, a bit of dirt and breathed into it and that dirt became a living being that became Adam you and I are descendants of Adam and Eve literally descendants of dust that have been breathed upon by God to create life Adam knew in the very beginning that he was a jar of clay that he was literally literally dust that had the breath of God on it. You and I now live in this place where the only thing that makes a difference between someone who's dead and alive is that whether they have the breath of God, whether they are inspired, whether they've been breathed into by God. And this is so important for us as people of faith in this time where we know that the thing that makes the difference between death and life is, if, is whether you contain the very breath, the very life, the very inspiration of God and his Holy Spirit working inside of each of us. But before we can understand, of course, what a passage means to us, we have to do the exegetical work and look at what it meant to the origi original hearers of this text. Now, 2 Corinthians comes to us, of course, after 1 Corinthians, and Paul is writing to the church in Corinth. In his first letter in 1 Corinthians, he's writing to them to, encouraging them to encourage them to stop bickering and to be in unity together. In 2 Corinthians, this one that we have, um, he is writing to them to, become, to, to join in and be in unity with him in his ministry as he's trying to explain to them how it is that he's operating with them and his ministry amongst them. He actually had lots of opponents in Corinth, people who, while he wasn't there, were tearing down his work and opposing the ministry that he has with them, saying that he's, he wasn't a true apostle and saying that actually because of his suffering, that suffering is proof that he wasn't sent from God. I don't know if you've ever th heard that or if you've ever thought of that or you've ever thought, oh, because I'm going through something right now, because I'm being hard pressed right now, because of these things that are happening in our world and we're suffering these hardships, it must be proof that that actually I'm not, that what, what's happening is, isn't from God and it's a sign that I'm drifting away. And what Paul is saying here actually changes that and flips the script on the way that we see the suffering in our lives and the way that we see the things that are going on in and around us. Paul responds in this passage, in, in, indeed in this entire book, to say that his suffering highlights his true dependence on Christ and points as Christ's strength being our strength and not our own. And so he begins there and says, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all surpassing power is from God and not from us. We hold something, guys, that is so precious and so beautiful. We hold something inside of us that is so amazing, but it is this, it, the glory of what we carry is in the contents, not the container. The glory of what we carry is the contents and not the container. The world in our culture points to the container as being the most important thing. Oh, look at that. Look at that. That's so impressive. That's so great. That's so excellent. That's so grand. That's so amazing. That's so slick. That's so, um, that's so uh, appealing or something like that. But what, what Paul is saying here is that the glory of the Christian life is the contents not the container, which is going to be important for us as we start to talk about, and as I share with you in just a few minutes, about some of the vision that we have for our church moving forward. We've always got to remember that it's the contents that are the most important thing. We carry around in this body of death the glory of Christ. In verse 6, he says, this treasure in jars of clay, what is the treasure? The treasure is the light of the glory of God that's been revealed in Jesus. And is it just incredible that God would entrust 
to us or that God would entrust the eternal glory of his son and let that be held inside of a brittle, broken, vulnerable vessel. Paul knows that the glory of the church is the contents, not the container. The container will change. The way that we express the the life of Jesus in and through us will change. There will be so many things that shift and change about the model and about the strategy and about the way that it all happens and about the way that it looks. But the one thing that does not change is the Christ glory that each one of us holds. It is the content that makes something special. It is an inside job. It is an inside job. He goes on and says, we're hard pressed on every side. We're we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but we're not in despair. We're persecuted, but we're not abandoned. We've been struck down, but we're not destroyed. You know, also in this passage, we have this We have this way of appropriating suffering where our suffering actually aligns us to Jesus rather than pushes us away. Sometimes your suffering will actually authenticate your faith rather than be something that says, well, that's what the reason why you don't have any faith and that's why you're suffering in this time. Do you know there is glory in walking with God through deep and dark times of suffering? There is glory in staying the course with patience and long suffering and doing that journey with him rather than just seeking a quick fix or getting a quick fix or getting quickly out of it or escaping a particular situation. It takes just as much faith for somebody to walk through seasons of chronic pain, that that just as much faith as that than for somebody to be healed instantly. I want to say that again. It will take as much faith for somebody to walk with faith through seasons of suffering than it does for somebody to have the faith to be healed instantly. One does not show that there is higher faith than the other. Our suffering aligns us to the journey of Jesus because if you don't have a theology of suffering, then you don't have a theology of who Jesus is. Because actually what Paul is saying here when he says hard-pressed on every side, when he says um, when he says uh, uh, perplexed, when he says persecuted, when he says struck down, he's not actually just talking about himself. He's talking about the ministry of Jesus because he says we carry around in our body the death of Jesus. Your ministry, part of your ministry, church, is to carry around in your body the death of Jesus. And I fear that some of us don't have a theology for that. Some of us don't know how to appropriate pain, how to appropriate suffering, how to live in the context of the now and the not yet. We have a great context for what's to come. But some of us can't, are uncomfortable with sitting in the fact that there is pain now that we carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus can be revealed in our mortal bodies. And if you do not have a place to put your pain right now, you're going to project it onto others. I guarantee you. If you do not have a way to be able to appropriate the things in your world right now that you do not understand, you're going to find somebody else to blame. And you're going to push it onto somebody else. Maybe you'll even push it onto God. But I think it's absolutely incredible here in this passage that Paul can say these things about himself. He can say that I'm hard pressed on every side. I'm perplexed. I'm persecuted and I'm struck down. And yet not once does he blame God for that. In fact, he glories in the fact that he identifies with Jesus in the process. So where are you sitting with that today? Because the glory is in the contents, not in the container. He is working in us. It is an inside job. Verse 11, he says, For we who are alive are always being given over to death. Who? For Jesus' sake. So that his life might also be revealed in our mortal bodies. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. Let me tell you, church, today God's mission has not changed. His mission and his purpose has not changed. The bigger story continues to be told. 
that people would come and, and find themselves inside of that story, give themselves a context for their life in such a huge and powerful way. Your job, the job, the mission has not changed, guys. It's to reveal the life of Christ to people in our world, to reveal the glory of Christ to people in our world. And maybe the fact that you're broken and brittle and bruised and a little bit vulnerable right now is going to be the thing that helps people see God's glory in you rather than take away from it. Can you start to live into that as a church? Can we start to live into the fact that we that we we know that we're not perfect? We've never said that we're going to be perfect. Discovery Church is a place of is a people of who are all imperfect. None of us have got it together. None of us know uh, have the perfect answers for the the challenges that we have in our world right now. But we cling to the hope of the gospel as revealed in Scripture in the glory of Jesus Christ. We cling to this, knowing that this is going to be the thing that makes the difference. Not our actions, not our performance, not our behavior, but our faith in Jesus Christ and him being the glory and the centerpiece of who we are, the glory inside of this earthen vessel, these jars of clay. It is an inside job. And so when we say, church, in the beginning of this series, hope lives here. When we say hope lives here, What we're actually saying isn't, hey, come and look at us. Look at what Discovery is doing. Look at how great Discovery is. Look at all the great things that um, that we're doing. Look at how amazing we are at, at, uh, at live streaming our service in a huge auditorium on one small laptop. Look at how excellent we've got all of these things that we're doing. Right? We're not saying that. When we say hope lives here, what we're saying is come and meet the glory of Jesus Christ because he is the contents that this fragile, brittle container tries to hold. And in the midst of that, we carry it around with, we, we kind of bumble around with it and we, we carry around with it in the midst of our suffering, in the midst of our questions, in the midst of our confusion, yet knowing that as we do that faithfully, it is the glory of Jesus that's revealed in the process. So over the course of this series, and as we think about future, as we think about vision, as we think about what it is that God is calling us to as a community, as a church community, as a faith community that has a place, that has a people, there are three main things that we're going to be looking at in the weeks that are ahead. The first one is land, the place of land. We are a people that have a place. The, there, are, there, is, there is parcels of land that God has called us to steward. Not to own, not to guard, but to steward. We're dreaming of the land that our, that our uh, building is currently located on in Mount Evelyn. We're dreaming of that and we're dreaming of it being a community hub that's in use seven days a week, 24 hours a day. We're dreaming of chapel spaces. We're dreaming of spaces for families. We're dreaming of spaces for, uh, for, mat- for mature and wise people. We're dreaming of spaces to reach out to our community. Of course, we're in the middle of relocating Discovery Community Care onto our primary site in Mount Evelyn. We're dreaming of places of hospitality. We're dreaming of places where we can be a community hub to steward this land for the blessing and the benefit of the community that lives around here. We're dreaming of, we're, we're, we're dreaming really, really big to think, hey, if God has called us to steward this land and we, we're stewarding this very big kind of jar of clay that's not perfect, that's filled with challenges. But if we've been called to steward that, how might God's glory be seen in it and through it for the if right throughout our entire community? We're dreaming of our land. And one of the big things that we're doing through the month of November is where is we're facilitating prayer walks around this very land in Mombok Road, uh, Mount Evelyn. Prayer walks as we step it out. We literally step on the land and pray, ask God that he would continue to reveal his heart and his purposes for this land that we've been called to manage, that we've been called to steward in this season. We're walking it out. We're praying on site with insight 
and walking and praying is something that um, that is going to be that's available for everybody to be able to do as far as you can walk and as far as you can pray. And so we're going to be stepping out as a very practical thing that we're doing in the month of November, and we'd love to invite you to be part of it. If you haven't registered for a prayer walk yet, jump online right now, jump onto the website, jump onto the Everyday Faith app and register for a prayer walk. It will align you and help you get connected with the land. Now, if you live somewhere else in Victoria, somewhere else in Australia, somewhere else in the world, you're not excluded from this either. In fact, we'd love you to pray with us about how we can continue to use this land, to steward this land for the blessing of the community. Now, secondly, a big thing we're, th we're talking about through the month of November in Hopeless here is location and locations. Location and locations. You see, we are, we are people of place. We, we derive our identity and we derive who we, who we are and who we're becoming from the people around us, from the places that are around us. And Mount Evelyn is the place where Discovery Church has been. But we're, and so we're saying we want to engage with and connect with in ever increasing ways the community that we're a part of to be a blessing and a servant and a good neighbor to our community. But what about other locations? What, what the amazing thing that's happened through this entire pandemic has been that we've seen people connect with what God's doing at Discovery Church from right around Australia and right around the world. And we're starting to think now, well, what if there were other locations that God wanted to, to be, that God wanted to transform into a Discovery Church location? Where are there other spaces, either in Australia or around the world? We're starting to pray about locations, groups of people gathering together, not in the name of Discovery, but in the name of Jesus, to serve God and to serve the people in that location with the biggest story of, of Jesus' story. So we're praying about the location that we're in. We're working more and more with our local council, with the people in our region to be able to be a great servant to what, to what is needed in our area. But what about other locations? If you live somewhere else in Australia and you're connecting with what, what God's doing here at Discovery, or you live somewhere else globally and you're connecting with what God's doing here at Discovery, we would love to hear from you. We'd love to start to pray and think about how we might use what it is that God's doing here to be a blessing in places right around the world. As currently we're working with partners in places like India, there is a, a a lot of different ways and so many things that we don't even see right now that we believe God is doing in our location here and locations in the future. So we've got our land. There's the locations and location that we're thinking about. And thirdly is our, the leverage that we have. This is the simple question that God asked Moses when Moses said, well, how am I going to lead these people out of Egypt? And God says to him, well, what's in your hand? What's in your hand? We sense God asking that question to us in discovery as well. What's in your hand? What have you got to leverage? What have you got? In, what are the gifts that you've been given? And now you might not feel like you've got much, but whatever you have, as the boy with the loaves and fishes knows, whatever you have placed in the hands of Jesus becomes something that will feed a multitude. What do you have in your hands? What are the gifts that we have? What are the gifts that we have collectively as a group of people? What are the gifts that we have to be able to offer? What are the strengths that we have demographically? What are the strengths that we have in our region? What are the things that we've been given? What are our opportunities that we have to be able to bless and serve the community? I think about our amazing young adult community. I think about our family ministries. I think about our amazing group of um, mature, wise, uh, experienced people who follow Jesus. Jesus for 30, 40 years plus and think that is an amazing gift that we need to be able to steward, not hoard, but steward for the purposes of the kingdom. And so that's what we're going to be exploring as we explore this idea over the next few weeks of Hope Lives Here. It really is an inside job. And just because it doesn't look perfect doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. Just because we're stumbling along and kind of 
kind of almost groping our way forward through this dark patch and not really sure what's happening in this volatile season that we're in. It doesn't shouldn't stop us because the kingdom continues to advance and the mission, my friends, has not changed. It hasn't changed. We carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus might be revealed. I just want to close this message now with a few questions for us to ponder as we come into a time where we close our we close our service together. The first question is this as it pertains to the death of Jesus. What are you afraid of? What are you afraid of right now? Because if we cannot be honest about our fears, we'll not experience freedom from those fears. You can't experience freedom from something you're not willing to acknowledge. What are you afraid of right now? There is a lot of fear in our world right now going in every which way. But I'm not hearing a lot of people say what it is that they're afraid of. I'm not hearing a lot of people be honest about where it is that they're at and the things that they're actually scared of right now. What is it that you're afraid of? Can you put that on the table and bring that to Jesus? Can you bring it to him and allow him to work with you in and through that? Where do you need God's comfort right now? Even in this moment, could we ask that Jesus would come, that his Holy Spirit would come and comfort us in the deepest places of our hearts? To comfort us in those places where we're afraid, where we're worried, where we're anxious. That we would allow God's non-anxious presence to be in and through us. Thirdly, what are your limitations I want you to list your limitations. Oh, I don't think about my limitations. I only think about what I can do in Christ. Yeah, cool. But there are things that each of us can and there are things that each of us can't do. And that's okay. What are your limitations right now? I know I've got a bunch. How can God use those? Paul's not, he doesn't shy away from his limitations. He lists them. He says, I'm struck down. You know, I'm perplexed. Um, there's a whole bunch of things that are going on for him in this season. He's got people opposing him in the church, which, are, you know, thank Jesus, isn't something new. Didn't just, it's not something that happened in 2021. It's happening for thousands and thousands of years. What is it that your, what are your limitations right now? And then fourthly, what are your opportunities? Because I feel like God is opening up to us an absolute, um, just a bucket load of opportunities for us to be able to explore together as a church. And likely you've got opportunities as somebody who follows, follows Jesus out there in the world, really where it counts. You've got opportunities to be able to serve, opportunities to be able to love, opportunities to show kindness, opportunities to be able to lift up, opportunities to be able to seek and save that which was lost. What are your opportunities in this season? Because as we go through this series over the next few weeks, exploring the stewardship of our land, the location that we are and potential other locations, the leverage that we've been given, we've got to be able to carry with it this sense of the death of Jesus and the life of Jesus, both at work in our bodies, knowing that it is an inside job and that what makes this special is the contents, not the container, and that that contents is the person and the work of Jesus Christ and his story. Let me pray for us. Father, I thank you for this time that we have today. I thank you for this amazing blessing, the privilege that we have to be called your people. Father, we thank you that we are jars of clay and that you are doing a renewing and restoring work on the inside of us that will eventually make its way out. Jesus, we want to thank you that you have amazing plans for this place. You have amazing plans for this people. And Lord God, we want to represent you and we want to do everything we can to display your glory to the world around about us. And so we thank you, Lord God, for the limitations and for the opportunities that are right in our midst. In Jesus' name, amen.